Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com, featuring artists Matt Fussell and Ashley Hurst. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live. We had a little bit of a hiccup before we went live. We did some adjustments to uh, the bitrate settings, and hopefully everything's good to go for all of you guys on YouTube. Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live point 2.0, I guess we could say. Uh, I did this a couple years ago, and a lot of people loved it, but my schedule got a little bit tight. But we're back again with uh, pretty much the, a similar form, format, but we're gonna add a couple of things in here. Um, and one of the things that we're gonna add this time, of course, is I'm gonna have my good friend and fellow artist and teacher, Ashley Hurst, along for the ride with us. Um, Ashley, how are you doing this evening? Are you doing pretty good? Yeah, I'm doing great. I hope you are. Um, thank you guys for joining us. I'm looking forward to drawing for you tonight. And Ashley is going to be on the chopping block tonight. What Getting Sketchy is, let me explain what that is. First of all, we're going to do a timed drawing exercise. So we're going to create a sketch in a defined time frame. And uh, the time frame tonight is going to be 45 minutes. So Ashley's going to have 45 minutes to create a sketch from start to finish. Now keep in mind that this is a sketch and this is all about just having some fun. So you're welcome to draw alongside Ashley if you want. Of course, you can ask questions. I'm gonna be manning the chat box here. I see everybody saying hello. There are a ton of you guys on here tonight. I hope that this is gonna be a fun experience for you. Now, before we get into things, I should say that uh, Getting Sketchy, of course, is brought to you by thevirtualinstructor.com. Over at thevirtualinstructor.com, we have a fantastic membership program that includes video courses on a variety of drawing and painting, media and subjects, which all include videos and eBooks. We also have weekly live lessons. In fact, when we're done broadcasting here on YouTube, we're gonna head over to thevirtualinstructor.com and, and continue with our live lessons. With the live lessons, we do more in-depth uh, lessons. We do drawings and paintings that are considered finished. So what we're gonna be doing here is a quick sketch, but you're gonna learn a lot, um, I think, tonight. Uh, but we also have weekly critiques our, as part of the Members Minute. There's eBooks. We also have a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers over there as well. You can check out our program by clicking on the link below, and you can also check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free too. There's a link for that below this video as well. But don't check that stuff out yet. We're ready to get into things, but uh, one of the things that we're gonna be doing here on the new Getting Sketchy is we're gonna be taking a look at art products every once in a while. Now, nobody is sponsoring this video other than the virtualinstructor.com, of course, um, but the products that we share with you are just products that people have asked us about or products that we actually enjoy using or like using. I get all kinds of questions all the time on, on what uh, products I recommend. And usually I tell folks it's whatever works for you. And I still stand by that, but people are insistent. So tonight we're gonna start off, our first product we're gonna talk about are Steedler pigment liner pens. These pens are fantastic. Of course, these are drawing pens. They come in a broad variety of different widths. They're a little bit more expensive than than other pens that you might be uh, familiar with, like the Micron pens, but uh, they're absolutely fantastic. The reason I like them is because the tips stay pretty strong for a longer period of time. If you've ever worked with Micron pens before, you know that they wear out pretty quickly. And Ashley actually had never used these pens before, and I gave him these pens last week to uh, try out for a little while. What'd you think of them, Ashley? Well, I don't want to reveal my age, but I grew up using the uh, Rapidographs, if you know what those are, and then switched to the Microns a number of years ago. And I was uh, pleased with the performance of these pens. They're comparable or better than the Microns. Um, you can actually see on the screen, if you look at the plastic tips, there's, there's like a grain to the plastic. It actually feels nice in your hand, almost like that hard plastic has been softened. And something, you know, presentation is everything. And something that uh, these pens do well is pre present themselves. The package, it, uh, it opens and then the top folds back and closes to create a stand so that you, um, you can easily find the, the width pen that you're looking for. Um, so I like the pens. I like the package. I liked everything about it. Yeah, and I really love them too. Um, I've been using them for a while, and some of the scenes that you just saw uh, playing there on your screen were from one of our courses 
uh, subjects with pen and ink where we do 30 drawings with pen and ink. Um, we use the technical drawing pens. We use those Steeler pens for some of the lessons. A lot of them we use the nib pens, of course, which is the more tr traditional approach. If you want to check these pens out, we do have a link in the description below. That is an affiliate link. It will take you over to Amazon if you want to pick up these pens. They do carry these pens at most uh, art stores. Uh, they also carry them at office supply store. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check it out. But I think we're now ready to get into the main event tonight. And that is a, draw, a drawing challenge. We're gonna have 45 minutes on the clock. Ashley's gonna have to create the drawing from start to finish. Of course, it's gonna be a looser sketch. So there's probably not gonna be a lot of shading going on. I'm not really sure what Ashley's gonna do. Oh no, gonna we're do. gonna cover this page. He's, he's going to do everything he can in 45 minutes. Ashley will will go through the materials he's going to be using r real quickly before he goes into the drawing. So are you ready? Let's do it. All right. Let's go ahead and switch over to the main camera then. All right. So here's a look at his drawing surface. I'm going to turn the timer off. We're not quite ready for that. Okay, so um, I've got an H pencil that I'm gonna start with so that those first lines just kind of melt into the drawing. And then I'm using a lead holder. It holds a piece of lead that's a little, quite a bit larger than what you might find in a standard mechanical pencil. The lead is as large as it would be uh, in a wooden pencil. And that's so as it dulls down, um, I, can, I can shade faster and smoother. I like to shade with a duller tip. So I'm gonna do most of the drawing with those two pencils. I also have the, uh, the pink pearl, a staple of art supplies, and, and I may use the kneaded, that's K-N-E-A-D, kneaded eraser, um, but sometimes I don't N-E-D need this eraser. So we'll see if, we'll see if, that, if that plays a part in our drawing. Um, I do have a stump, but I'm gonna try to avoid using it. I want my marks to retain their integrity, but uh, we'll see if I feel like I'm falling behind and need to cover some space. I might, I might pull this stump in. All right, so are you ready to go? Am I ready to start the timer? Okay, let's go. Uh, one thing I will say that the reference that Ashley's working from is from a site called pixabay.com. You can see it up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, it was a color image um, and I took the color out of it using Photoshop. So we just got black and white. We just got the values to deal with. And it looks like Ashley's already started. So I need to start the timer. Let's do this. I'm cheating. 40, 45 minutes, let's go. Okay, I've laid my pencil down on what I believe is the gesture of this boat. You know, we talk about gesture drawing sometimes when we talk about drawing people, but all objects have a gesture and the, the, the direction that this boat is moving through the composition is its gesture. So I wanna actually start with that. It's a line that's not really there, um, but it'll help me kind of build, build, I'll build my boat around it. There we are. Okay. So it looks to me, just so you know what I was doing, I was finding the center of my page and it looks to me like the tip of the boat is slightly above and just to the left of that. So I was just trying to plot a spot, you know, it's just an approximation um, to where I might start my, my line, my gesture. All right, so here it goes. All right, Cynthia is asking, how hard or soft is the lead in the lead holder? It, it, oh, great question. I should have mentioned that it's 3B, just so you know. So it's pretty soft. And I've got some other pencils here on the table that are probably about the same in case I have a blowout. And just a little bit of additional information for those of you who are wondering, when we're talking about the softness or hardness of a pencil, uh, the graphite inside of the pencil uh, can be harder or softer. And softer pencils are usually designated with a B. So uh, you've got HB that's directly in the center of what I like to call the pencil scale. And the further you go, um, towards the Bs, so that's 2B, 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B, and so on, the pencil gets softer and softer and softer. So a 3B pencil, for example, is softer than a 2B pencil, and a 2B pencil is softer than an HB pencil. And because the graphite is softer, more of the material is going to go onto the surface that you're making marks on. So that means that the marks are gonna be darker. So softer pencils are gonna make darker marks. So a 3B, a 3B pencil is gonna make a darker mark naturally with the same pressure than an HB pencil. Now, harder pencils are designated with H's and they go, do the same thing, 2H, 3H, 4H, 5H, and so on. And uh, the, the higher you go up the H side of the scale, the harder the pencil and the lighter the mark. So uh, for example, a 5H pencil is gonna be much lighter than a 2H pencil. All right, I'm just trying to put some really hard marks in, to kind of define the uh, the water. 
against the mountain or the land in the sky, approximately where that's going to be. I want things to land pretty close to where they belong. Um, I did select this image because I liked the composition, so I don't want to mess around with it too much. I know there's a timer on your screen, and behind that is the larger portion of the land, and I might actually make an adjustment to this composition and, and bump up the size of that, um, that land mass just to balance out the weight of the boat a little bit. All right, let's see. And if you need me to hide the photo reference at any point in the timer, well, I, I can't hide the timer. That's the official timer, but I can hide um, the uh, the photo reference. So if you want me to do that, Ashley, you can just let me know okay. at any point. That sounds good. Now, I don't want to draw too um, clearly or too detailed. I don't want to start to draw the wood planks on the side of the boat. I actually want to get to shading soon. That's important when you're sketching is to jump right into the value and you can make corrections to proportion um, along the way. You know, artists used to work super fast because they were racing against the sun or racing against the burning of their candles. And nowadays with uh, photographs, and I'm talking about from like 1850 forward, nowadays uh, with photographs and uh, electric lights, you know, we get in the habit of working pretty slow. So I appreciate an opportunity to, to sketch and to draw fast. And uh, who says visual art isn't performance art, right? Um, Color in with D says, I find that I'm too exact when sketching. I see an error, so it bothers me. And I, I notice how loosely you're sketching things. Do you wanna make any comment about starting loosely like you are here so that Color in with D knows that it's okay to be loose? Well, um, <laughs> It takes, it takes a, it, it's hard to let go, I'll be honest, sometimes. We have a tendency to want to get everything right from the beginning. And, you, you know, uh, artwork happens over a span of time, you know, and that, there's, I'll tell you what, revision is part of the artistic process. So you just want to get your paper covered, um, get as ri rid of the white as, as quickly as you can. Um, just like I mentioned before, like you're racing against the sun or racing against time, and then you can slow down and go back and start your refinement process. Think about it like you would write an essay. You know, you start with a rough draft, and it's called rough for a reason. And then, the, and then you refine that draft over, uh, over a couple of different readings or sessions. So I don't know how much refinement I'll get to, but I want to at least uh, try to get things covered tonight. And um, Sharon adds, I read that B stands for black and H stands for hard. I have also heard that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's pretty accurate. <laughs> uh, so that's a good way if you forget if B pencils are the softer ones or the harder ones, you can always remember the B for black. You know, I've, I've wondered that myself. I've kind of imagined that they might be the beginning of a word in a different language, like maybe Italian or French. I'm not real sure. So that's, a, that's good. I'll go with that. Um, and I don't know if you mentioned this or not to the paper you're working on. Did you mention the type of paper? Um, I believe it is, it's kind of standard drawing paper, like 80 pound drawing paper. It's yeah. got a, it's got a noticeable tooth to it to grab, you know, to grab some of this graphite right off of the pencil. Yeah. So you're noticing that there's a texture on the surface there uh, when you're watching this and that texture is referred to the tooth of the paper. And obviously the tooth of the paper affects the marks that you make on the surface. Um, and a lot of times people, especially beginners, overlook the surface that they choose to work on. And, you know, honestly, that's the foundation of your artwork and it plays a major role in the finished result. So it's very important to strongly consider the surface you're working on. Now, clearly this is a sketch. So this is actually just sketch paper, just taken right from a sketchbook. So this is a 80 pound drawing paper. It's white sulfate drawing paper, pretty standard, but it does have a tooth associated with it. So if you like to draw at home and you're grabbing the typing paper or printing paper um, and drawing on it, you're gonna notice there's not a lot of tooth there. That really means that paper is not gonna, it's not gonna give you um, a good surface to work on. I'd say that you're gonna see a lot of smearing that happens. It's gonna be a little bit more difficult to get a variety of different textures. If Ashley wanted to make this drawing look smooth, he could always use a blending stop or he could work a little bit slower with his marks and create smooth gradations of tone and value. If you're working on typing paper, for example, you're gonna notice that graphite is uh, a lot more shiny because there's less tooth on the surface and you're also gonna run into more issues with smearing. 
Now, um, something I like to do when I draw is find the darkest thing first, and this is pretty much the shadow of the boat, and go ahead and, uh, and, and, and go dark. Don't be afraid to go dark early because it's going to make the rest of your paper um, feel too white, and it will encourage you to get those mid-tones in and to get them darker um, sooner. You know, there's something to be said for building up your values in uh, multiple layers, especially if you're have a tendency to work carefully from the beginning. Um, but uh, actually, not only what's dark, I like to identify in my own mind where the darkest areas are and where the lightest areas are and so that I know that I'm working between them. Uh, Color with D says, how does the refinement work if you've overdone the shadowing? Well, um, I don't, I have to say that erroring on the side of too dark is okay, okay? You just bring everything else down a little bit too. That's probably not the answer you're looking for. Um, but dark artwork shows up really well from a distance and light artwork, not so much. So I'd rather my entire drawing be a little darker than my reference. And uh, it's all, you know, it's all relative, so. And that's a great point uh, that Ashley brings up. And I, I, well, I should point out that it's great that there, we have two different artists on here because I tend to tell folks it's all, you can always go darker. So it's a little bit better to err on the lighter side of things. But we all have different approaches, and uh, you do need to make sure that you have a full range of values. So you need to make sure that you do have the darkest darks and the lightest lights and the, the middle values in between. And some of us get to those darker values a little bit quicker. Obviously, Ashley likes to get to those darker values quicker. But if you do go too dark and you don't want to uh, mess with the texture, you don't want to disturb the texture of, of the paper. For, for example, if he was to go into the shadow on the back of that boat and make it lighter and he used a pink pearl eraser or a vinyl mm. eraser, it would smear that graphite it's True, and it would change the texture. But if he used a kneaded eraser to just dab the surface, it would actually lift up the graphite. I'll go ahead and do that. And Yeah, there you go. So you Look can see it, it lifted up the graphite, it made the value lighter, but it preserved the texture. And that's why it's so important to have a kneaded eraser. <laughs> okay, it looks like I lost about 30 seconds with that little demonstration. So, <laughs> Well, I'm it's not, worth it, of course. I'm reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time, if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, Matt asked, would your approach be different on gray-toned paper? Um, yes. Um, it's a whole different animal. And I love, to, I love to draw on gray paper. And usually on the... I mean, I'm still looking for the darkest areas first. Um, on gray paper, the midtones are already there. You don't really have to work so hard to get the paper covered quickly. Um, so I try to take a, a gray paper drawing as far as I can and make it look as good as I can before I use a white, before I use any kind of material to find those lights. I don't know if that, if that makes sense or helps any. And again, that's another benefit of having another artist on here. When I work on gray paper, I put down very minimal applications of graphite first and then um, put the white applications on or start with the white application. So for me, when hmm. I'm working on gray paper, I'm, I'm imagining that I'm starting in the middle of the value scale and I want to push those values out. So uh, I, I slowly add darker values with the graphite and slowly add lighter values with white charcoal, which is what I typically like to work with. The, the thing that you have to be careful with, with when you're combining white charcoal with graphite is the white charcoal will not cover the graphite. Uh, if you've ever tried to apply white charcoal over the top of graphite, then you know this. So you kind of have to get to a point where you, you preserve your light areas. So you preserve the areas of lighter value uh, before you go too dark with the graphite, just to make sure that you can go, go in with those strong highlights if you need to. Color in with D now says, oh, wow, I need a kneaded eraser. <laughs> um, I love kneaded eraser jokes. Bistone King and, or by Stone King, ask, uh, what is the best kind of kneaded eraser? Well, um, you know, uh, Prismacolor is a good kneaded eraser. Generals is a good kneaded eraser. I don't like to talk bad about people, and that goes for art supplies too, but I believe there's a brand called Lyra. Does that sound familiar to you, Matt? Lyra um, or Lyra? Yeah, mm -hmm. they make colored That pencils. is the stickiest yeah. kneaded eraser I've ever used. It's like, <laughs> it's like erasing with chewed up bubble gum. And they, they uh, I used, I bought some because they come in their own nice little plastic package. And if you've used, if you've dropped in a kneaded eraser on the floor, you know that it comes up with, uh, with foreign objects in it, uh, grit, dirt, 
pet hair, um, those types of things. And uh, so I like the idea of a kneaded eraser having its own package, but I could barely get that kneaded eraser out of its package. That's how sticky it was. So I would say they're all pretty okay, except don't, you know, don't buy Lyra, if that's how you pronounce that one. So sorry, Lyra. Yeah, if you, if you guys have been following the channel for a while, you know that I absolutely love General's products. Uh, I love the General's Layout Pencil, which is a fantastic all-around pencil. Uh, I, I love to use the General's um, White Charcoal um, as well. And um, as far as needed erasers go, that's usually what I buy. You know, what I've noticed is um, I've had some experience with some colored needed erasers before the ones that are like yellow and yeah pink i was and gonna blue. ask you about that and and those i don't think do as well as the just the standard gray ones I, interesting it doesn't seem like that would make any sense as far as the color goes but maybe the pigmentation that they add um with those colored ones you know affect I just the never, quality i never bought or used <laughs> them because i figured they would look pretty bad pretty early you know as you start to build up graphite and charcoal in there that color is going to disappear anyway yeah those gray ones hide all that that junk that gets on there that's for sure okay so i am going to just try to get this try to get this piece of paper covered now and again um maybe i'm shading too 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 dark but i've got my needed eraser in fact i'm planning to use my eraser to go in and find that cloud at the top of the page uh nearer the end of our sketch our drawing we're about a third of the way through so i need to leave this boat alone for a while and consider the rest of the page of course you know i'll just uh, i'll take it as far as i can i want to get a few details in um just to give the just to give the drawing some character. So I'm planning on using, uh, you know, the ridges on the boat for that. Some of the reflections down here in the water, particularly those dark reflections under this item, which I cannot name or identify. And then also, um, you know, some of the, uh, some of the foliage that's growing up around and behind the boat. So, but if I don't get rid of the white of the page, then the boat's not really going to have a sense of light. All right. The, the light on the left side, or our left side of the boat, I guess it's the left side of the boat, and a little bit right in here. I need that to be the lightest thing. That's what I want to be the lightest thing in the picture. So right now it's competing with all of this, and it keeps it from feeling like, a, like the sun is doing its job. And I like to kind of keep in my mind when I'm trying to create a, a realistic drawing, uh, that you do really want to get rid of all of the white. Uh, you might leave a, a, a light area or a white area, maybe in a highlight area on an eye or something like that. But for the most part, uh, there's not a whole lot of pure white in, in the world. Same thing is true about black. There's really not a true black in the world. We really see just dark grays and light grays. Um, so if you want your drawings to appear realistic, one of those things you need to do is get rid of the white, like Ashley said. Now, um, you might notice that all of these strokes I'm making in the negative space for the water and the sky, I'm trying to keep them really level because I don't want the water to feel like it's a tilted surface. So if, if you are applying value to a flat field or in this case, you know, relatively still water, um, I would recommend horizontal strokes. It just helps it to feel like it's flat and like it's laying down. If these strokes went in different directions or were at an, at an angle, um, it might t I might accidentally start to create form in there. You know, if the strokes were curvy, it might feel like the surface of the water is curved. So we want to avoid that and try to keep our strokes nice and level if we can. All right, well, as I got, um, as I covered the page and got rid of at least... Um, in a minimal way, got rid of the white. Um, the values of my boat started to look, to look way too light. So I know I can get in there and get a little darker. I've got some adjustment I need to make up here. I feel like that uh, this needs to be maybe a sharper or harder turn. So I might get in there with the eraser a little bit. I don't like it. Like, like Matt said, I don't want to make too many abrupt changes um, and disturb the uh, quality of my, of my strokes, but I might use the needed eraser a little bit for that. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, when you darkened up the water around the boat, that made a huge difference. It, it all of a sudden looked a whole lot more finished. All of a sudden it's a drawing. Right. You know, just because the white of the paper is gone. So um, I had a great teacher who would encourage us to, you know, you, um, someone mentioned before, you know, how do you force yourself to draw, draw tight, or I'm sorry, draw loose and, and not so tight? 
um, you want to feel like you're running a race. All right, maybe the timer would help. Maybe you should, you guys at home should uh, should give yourself a time limit and practice um, working kind of uh, under the clock because it does encourage you um, to get rid of the white as fast as you possibly can. If that's your goal, if the goal is to destroy the white of the paper, um, then, then uh, maybe the uh, the thoughts that creep in that tell us that we need to stop and go back and making a proportional adjustment, maybe they won't creep in if a, uh, w so a well-proportioned drawing isn't your number one goal, at least in the beginning. Um, Diane asked, do you ever use graphite sticks to color larger areas faster? Oh yeah, it's a great idea. Should have brought some graphite sticks. And um, Karen says, what is the particular General's pencil mentioned? That was General's layout pencils. Um, they might be hard to find in the art store. You might have to order them online. Um, but you can order a dozen of them and you'll be happy, trust me. <laughs> They're a great pencil. They're kind of uh, equivalent to about a 4B pencil. But what's really great about them is the, the graphite inside of them is harder than a 4B pencil. And I know that sounds a little bit strange, but it, it's true. Um, so they, as a result, they keep their tip sharp a, a lot longer than a 4B pencil does, but you're still able to get those dark values. You can you can really create a broad range of uh, different values with that one pencil, which is what makes it so great. And I wanna go back to when you were talking about making horizontal strokes in the sure. water, and you said you wanted to make sure you didn't make them curved because right. you would create the illusion of form there. And uh, when we talk about making marks in a specific direction, usually that kind of falls in line with uh, cross contour lines, which a lot sure. of people have difficulty grasping that concept of cross contour lines. Um, basically cross contour lines are either real or imagined lines that flow over the form of a subject. One example of this with the drawing that Ashley's working on right now are the slats in the side of the boat. Uh, you can see that they curve up the side of the boat. Now, if you were looking at the boat from the side, directly from the side, those those lines would be straight. But because we're looking at the boat from the angle we're looking at, those, those lines curve. And if you were to fill in the value on that side of the boat, in other words, add some shading there, you would want your strokes to flow in the same direction as those slats. Just like the strokes on the back end of the boat are, are flowing in a slight diagonal, and on the inside of the boat, they're also flowing with the form of each little section of the boat. And those are called cross contour lines. And Ashley is just doing this intuitively. But uh, for those of you who are new to drawing, you, you might not really think about the directional strokes you make when you're adding shading, but they, they really make a huge difference in creating the illusion of form. So not only do we need to think about the value, but we also need to think about the directional strokes that we make. And this carries over into your paintings as well. The direction of your brush stroke makes a difference in creating the illusion of form as well. Okay, Helen asks, what are the benefits to working quickly? Hmm. Well, you can make more drawings in the in a given amount of time, so you have more artwork to sell. That would be that would be one. Just uh, and then I would say, I'm um, learning to see the the big picture first. All right, it's not seeing seeing the forest before the trees. So, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the drawing, I was looking for the lightest thing um, and the darkest thing. Okay, and those are that's a that's that's I guess that's very very general. So. I would just say that maybe it, it steers you towards um, a completed drawing sooner. And I would add that uh, when you're sketching like this, uh, you are exercising the same mental muscles that you would be exercising if you were doing a long, very detail-oriented drawing with the same subject. Uh, you're going to get more exercise with a longer um, a longer drawing session, but you're still exercising those muscles. Your drawing is about observation. You, you make marks, of course, but you've got to understand what you're seeing in order to, to make the correct marks. So the more that you practice sketching like this, the stronger you're going to get at those longer drawings, those more finished drawings that you work on because you're practicing. It's just like, uh, you know, basketball. I like to, to compare everything with art with basketball for some <laughs> reason, but, um, you know, if you, if you're, on a basketball team, you might go out and practice. You might practice dribbling, doing layups, or your jump shot, or whatever, and you're not in a game, but you're still practicing. So sketching like this is kind of like doing those layups, kind of practicing those 
practicing dribbling, practicing your jump shot. And then when the game comes, when it's time to create the finished image, you are prepared for that because you, you've got the skills in place. Hopefully that makes sense there. Okay, uh, Crystal says, do you ever do you ever find you get tired and the lines get sloppy, especially when filling in large areas? Um, I guess so. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, one person's sketch is another person's uh, sloppy, I guess. I'm a pretty loose artist anyway. Sometimes I like to, to draw by starting with value and not having any lines at all. Just kind of make a big cloud and then start working out of it. So um, it's, it tends to be my, I guess, my um, nature to work in a, in, a, in, a, in a looser way. So I don't know if it, I don't know if it is a result of tiredness or, or a lack of concentration or just personal temperament. And that, that really makes uh, perfect sense because, you know, we can kind of compare it to working with clay. If you're going to build something out of clay, you start with a, maybe a big ball of clay and then you, it's really nothing in the beginning. The more, the more you mold it and work it around, it eventually becomes something. And we've kind of seen that happen here with Ashley's drawing. It's started off uh, being pretty loose. And as he's gone through the process, it's slowly becoming refined. Um, he's not moving his arm as broadly as he did before. Still moving it quickly. Working towards smaller and smaller marks. And um, Dick says, practice makes perfect A. And yes, that's true. That's right. Uh, Christine asked, do you plan out your values ahead of time? Um, I guess I do. I mean, when I mentioned uh, that I'm looking for what's the, what the darkest areas are first, um, I guess that would actually be planning out my values, sure. And if you're having trouble seeing values or recognizing values or putting a full range of value in your drawings, it's always a good idea to work with a value scale handy. Of course, a value scale is just a scale of values. I would say it needs to have a minimum of seven values. So one value is going to be as dark as you can make the material go. And then, of course, the lightest value is going to be white. Um, and you can always use that value scale and make comparisons to your drawing to make sure that you have a full range of value. And also, you can use that value scale to make comparisons to the reference if you're working with a photo. That's great. I, I didn't even think of, to mention the value scale, but when I was actually a student um, numerous years ago, not that many years ago, I promise, um, I was required to make a value scale down here in the bottom of every one of my drawings. For about three years, I made a value scale every day, and I would use it um, as an assistant, you know, in identifying the values that I saw out there in front of me. And, um, you know, I still do that. And after, after a number of years of using a value scale, you've, uh, I think it actually helps to see the subtleties between values. It's been said, and I don't know who said it. I'm probably making this up myself. It's been said that <laughs> Rembrandt could see or discern the difference between 90 values. Now, who started that rumor? Probably Rembrandt himself. But uh, and I've, I also am aware that most por many portrait artists will pre-mix nine values, I do myself, um, when I start a uh, flesh color, flesh tone, you know, I make a warmer and a cool version of a flesh color, but I, but I mix it in uh, into nine values and I work uh, with those. And I'll be honest, it's pretty hard for me to see clear differences between with a scale with any more than maybe nine values. So if Rembrandt saw 90, then uh, that's pretty impressive. Okay, homemade food be rocking. I'm going to say that again. All right. Homemade food be rocking says, I'm drawing this piece in charcoal. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. This is a great piece for charcoal, especially up here in the clouds where I, I hope to get back to. Those little, those little white marks that dance across the tops of the clouds, a kneaded eraser is perfect for pulling those out, especially from charcoal. Charcoal is probably a better, an even better... Um, medium to use with, an, with a kneaded eraser. Okay, and Hannah asked, would it be better to draw an image first before you attempt to paint it? Um, I actually do. I think that's pretty common. If you look through the sketchbooks of the old masters, you can see portions of their paintings having been drawn. You know, think about it like this. Um, a musician usually doesn't play their music for the first time in front of an audience. You know, they practice it first, and that's what our 
our journals and our sketchbooks are for. There's for working out um, in a medium that's maybe more comfortable or familiar, some of the problems that we're gonna tackle and conquer in a painting. Okay, and Midnight Horse says, do lithographs have to be sketched in black? And do you know much about lithography? I, I know that unfortunately the lithography is not as a practice of a printmaking process as it used to be. It's beautiful. It's not, yeah, that's but right. But it, it is hard to find sometimes the limestone that you need and the chemicals that you need now. and. Um, so it is beautiful, but it looks just like a charcoal drawing practically. It can, a charcoal drawing that hasn't been smeared. And, and because we can reproduce images the way we do um, nowadays, those that might would choose lithography for the look, um, just choose charcoal and reproduce it. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. I, I actually took lithography in college. I, I think I took every art class that was uh, offered at the art school that I went to. Um, I don't think I wanted to graduate, but... Um, I did take mm -hmm. lithography, and I, I loved lithography, but it is it is frustrating. And a lot of people don't understand that M.C. Escher, a lot of his images are lithographs. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at them and think, hey, that's a great graphite drawing, but it is a lithograph. And when you understand the process of lithography, you really appreciate uh, M.C. Escher's work a lot more because with lithography, traditionally it's done by using a special wax crayon on a piece of limestone that has been flattened down using these large grinders. And then once you've got the image in place, you run a series of chemicals over the top. And at one point of the process, you actually erase your entire image. And, and, and just it pray is, that it comes back. It is completely gone. And then if you did your chemical processing correctly, when you roll the ink over the surface, your image reappears. Then you have to take this huge massive limestone over to the printing press and run it through the press at the exact right pressure because if you put too much pressure on it, you'll break the limestone. And when I was in college, there was only one remaining rock quarry in the world that that actually uh, produced those limestones and it was in Germany. So these limestones were incredibly expensive. So it was very, very nerve wracking. My teacher gave me a, a large piece of limestone to work on. Um, and I was thankful for that, but you guys know I like to draw small anyway. <laughs> I still have that lithograph somewhere around here that I did on that large piece of limestone, but it, it is really an in-depth process. And when you consider that you can take any drawing that you create today and reproduce it, um, that's why lithography is kind of a dead art, but it is, it is much more than just an art form. It's definitely a craft and there's some precision involved in the process. It's almost it's almost a scientific process that you go through with all the chemicals and everything. Um, okay, Dick asked Matt. Ashley also has a does Ashley also have a YouTube channel or question mark? Well, I have I have several, and uh, most of them actually house videos that are unpublished that I use in the classroom. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, Ashley teaches at a uh, visual and performing arts magnet high school. He's the head of the department there. Um, he's also a really incredible uh, award-winning oil painting, painter. Oh, thank um, you. And um, so he is with physical students all day. Well, not right now. They're not all right virtual. Now. <laughs> but uh, in normally fact, he's in What I'm classroom. doing right now, I've been doing all day, but for a much smaller <laughs> audience, an audience of, of 20 to 40 at a time. Um, all right. Uh, homemade food be rocking. Love that name. Could... Ask, could I send you my charcoal version of this piece when I'm done? Yeah, if you want to head over yeah. to the virtual instructor when you're done, we do have, uh, there's a contact form over there. You can send me your art if you want. If you're a member of the site, I do critique artworks uh, each week as part of the Members Minute. There's a special page to upload art there. Again, you do have to be a member for your art to be considered for critique, but yeah, you can check that out. Um, By Stone King says, can you use Copic Multiliner? for this, I guess. Well, I I mean, you, any, you know, any composition can be recreated with the medium of your choice. It may have a different feel or mood to it. You know, sometimes I choose a medium based on uh, the mood that I want to create. Um, I don't typically draw with, uh, with actual markers myself. I use 
I use digital markers a lot in program called Procreate, that kind of thing. So um, unfortunately, my experience with the markers is virtual. And I would say that really the subject that you work with is really irrelevant as to the medium that you're sure. gonna work with. I mean, you can, uh, there are some subjects that are gonna lend themselves better to certain media. For example, if you have a subject that's very linear, um, then a linear medium like pen and ink is probably gonna be a little bit easier to work with. Uh, but really, it, it really doesn't matter. You can you can um, tackle any subject that you wish with any medium that you're most comfortable with. So if you like working with markers and you want to do this image with markers, then absolutely you can do it. You can do it in grayscale, of course. Um, Copit makes a variety of different grayscale values. I have Prismacolor markers. That's typically what I use just because I bought the Prismacolor markers a long time ago and they were expensive and I really I'm happy with them enough not to switch over to the Copic markers. Uh, I, I call them Copic and Copic. I think the, pronoun <laughs> the correct pronunciation is probably Copic. I, I um, think I call them Copic markers, and I know that uh, my students absolutely love them. Some of them, and they're, they're honestly, they're just uh, too expensive for my school to purchase because I'm worried about the caps being left off, you know, four or $5 markers. So a lot of my students purchase them on their own and I let them use them for their projects because they do blend really well. And really the advantage that the Copics have over the Prismacolor markers are the brush tips, I would say. Uh, the Prismacolor markers, you know, have, they have a thin tip, which is really not that thin. And then they have a broad edge and if, Whenever I use the markers, I've done a few drawings where it's just marker, but for the most part, I combine the markers with colored pencils. The colored pencils provide the precision while the markers kind of are able to cover a large area in a shorter period of time. So, Ron asks, what kind of brush eraser did he just use? Did you use a brush eraser? Um, I actually used, that's a great question. I was using the back end, I believe this is what you're referring to, of a black wing pencil. Their erasers are kind of wide, like a brush, and uh, they come out so that as you wear them down, you can um, extend them. So these, these there's, a, there's a little extra eraser in here. So I can stretch that out, I don't need to yet, and then just pop it back in there. So this eraser um, extends a little bit. Now that's a little too much eraser, um, but you kind of get the idea. So. The black wing pencils have a really smooth piece of graphite inside. Um, it just glides right across the surface. And I just tested those pencils out here recently. I did a drawing with them. Um, I'll have probably a short review of those pencils uh, here on YouTube shortly, but the drawing is more than likely going to be part of a course, but I'll probably put the time lapse of that drawing up. I really, really loved using those pencils. One of the pencils specifically, but I'll leave you hanging on which one of them mm -hmm. there are. There are three pencils that I ordered. Um, they're all different, uh, but there's one that really stands out amongst the other ones, and uh, I'll share that with you later. Sam asked, when is the next Getting Sketchy? The next Getting Sketchy is scheduled for next Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, same time next week. Um, and of course, if you miss it, it's going to be recorded here on YouTube. Um, this version, the recorded version should automatically appear on YouTube shortly after we're done here. Um, and we hope to just continue this each and every week. We're calling this season two, I guess. I guess I'm calling it season two. We'll go for uh, a number of episodes. I haven't determined how many. We might take a break here and there, of course. Uh, but it's a lot of fun, I think. Uh, and Ashley's drawing is looking fantastic at this point. Absolutely fantastic. And also I've noticed that there's a lot of dropped frames tonight. Looks like we dropped 5.3%. I've been live streaming as part of the membership program at the Virtual Instructor since 2012. Of course, we use uh, all custom stuff here and we haven't done a lot of streaming here on YouTube. So I will adjust the bitrate settings here. It seems like I need to stream maybe in a lesser quality on YouTube for whatever reason. Um, so I know that there's probably been some hiccups tonight due to those, those drop frames. So I'll make adjustments during the week and we'll make sure that everything is smooth, uh, for next week's broadcast. Uh, let's see. Chris, our art student says, hi guys, I'm just not good with sketching. I just end up wanting to do it properly, which ends up a proper piece of work. I would really love to sketch sometimes. Have you got, do you have any tips on this? Well, um, I, I, I got to tell you, I feel like um, all of my drawings start out as a sketch and somewhere in the process they turn into a drawing. So um, I, 
I hesitate to say, um, but I would suggest you just don't not care very much in the beginning. And I don't know if that comes across as thing as, as, as interpreted in the wrong way. You just can't <laughs> care too much. And I think that's true in a lot of a lot of the things we do in life. When we care too hard or too much, we try too hard, our muscles get tight, and um, you want to draw, you want to sketch with your with your shoulder. And with your elbow, you know, I don't want to do too much of this business in the beginning, right? So we're trying to use more of, more of our arm and a little bit less of our wrist in the beginning. Very good advice. Yeah, you, you really, the, the, the less you can use your wrist, the better. You have more control, actually, when you use your whole arm. When you see, here's another analogy. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. When you see a putter, a golfer putt. Yeah, I um, was going to go there. Okay. I wasn't sure if, if I should bring up uh, bring golf into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can bring golf into it. Um, <laughs> when you see a putter putt, um, you know they they putt with their shoulders. They if you putting if you're putting with the, your wrist, it's usually a mistake. And a lot of times, uh, golfers refer to this as the yips. Now, don't tell Jack Nicholas that. <laughs> That's right. So there's exceptions to every rule, I guess. Um, yeah, I would I would you know what Ashley said there is not to care too much. Um, I, I just would too expand. soon. Yeah, too soon. Too soon. That's good. I. You, you got to separate yourself from the artwork that you create. What The artwork you create is a product. It's an artifact. It is not who you are as a person. If you co- totally destroy a piece of artwork, you have not done anything to yourself, okay? <laughs> You're working with a piece of paper and a pencil, and it's okay to mess things up. In fact, it's encouraged to, to mess things up every once in a while. You don't know how, lo- how far you can take things until you go too far. <laughs> and with a piece of paper and a pencil, mm-hmm. uh, you can take it as far as you want. You're not going to hurt anything anybody or or do anything terrible you know you're talking about risk taking right and that definitely is part of the artistic process it's the way artists develop a voice and develop new processes so that uh so that you know artwork can remain exciting from decade to decade okay just to give you a heads up we're almost at the five oh my gosh uh, but you're doing fantastic. I think the drawing looks great especially in just 45 just minutes trying to get a few little smaller marks in there I'm still still think I want to get darker. Ali Ace asks, is it a good idea to use archival ink pen after drawing? Do you mean an, a pen over your drawing? Do you think that's the question there, Matt? I think, I think that's what, uh, I'm assuming that's what she means. Now, in a drawing like this, I would not put ink over the top of it. No, it's, it's um, not unless uh, I, I switched ink much sooner. Yeah, typically with an ink drawing, you want to just put down those contour lines with graphite and then worry about creating the value range by by the positioning of the lines that you apply with the ink. So you're using hatching or cross hatching and the amount of white of the paper that shows through determines uh, what value you create. So the closer you put the lines to each other, the darker the value, of course. Um, and it's it's going to be a, a different approach, obviously, because with the graphite, you're creating gradations or slow changes of value from dark to light. Um, Diane adds the Copic markers the gray ones are great for doing quick thumbnail sketches during plain air painting okay great Um, Christine asks do you apply an archival spray to save your drawings when you are finished I do Um, you know even if you put drawings into a folder and you just pick that you know uh, pick that folder up and move it around occasionally, just the sliding back and forth of the papers on top one of one another is going to take, it's going to smudge and smear the graphite into your, your highlights. So I, I, I usually spray sometimes just with workable fixative if I don't have any final fixative available. And um, the brand that I typically use is Grumbacher simply because I've been using it my whole life. Go with what you know. When he was old enough to use it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, Chris, our art student, says that's looking great. Thank you. Could, I could use another 45 minutes or so. We're running out Yeah, of you time. really, there's really a lot of pressure there, isn't it? Oh, uh, yes. It's good to see somebody else under that pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like running a gauntlet a little bit, so... You're we'll welcome, Crystal. Nice Crystal says, in here. "Crystal says, thank you for this class. Oh, thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate that. If you weren't, I would just be it would just be me and Matt sitting here drawing a boat. So yeah, well, I'd be watching him draw the boat. <laughs> um, 
All right, let's see. We've got a couple little details I'm missing Okay, here. Uh, let's nice. see. Mantled Maven. I love these names. Mantled. Am I saying that right? Mantled. Man, Mantled Maven says, I go on free guided walk through a local Autobahn park with bird watchers. I took a pencil and a sketchbook. It has helped me to learn to sketch and not to try to finish everything. That's a Perfect. great. That's great. That's a great thing. Yeah, I think I, that's a better answer to a question earlier on how to how to get sketchy. And yep. that is um, stop using your camera phone so much and use your sketchbook instead and you'll see those shadows changing while you're drawing out there you know you start drawing in a in a in a landscape environment and you you feel like you've you really nailed a, a shadow and 20 minutes later you'll see that its shape has changed and that will encourage you to draw even faster yeah and um i took i had to take you know like i said i took pro probably every art class you could take in college um i took four years of figure drawing so uh, at the beginning of every figure drawing class, even if we were working on longer uh, poses, we would do a gesture sketch work uh, warm up exercise where the model would, you know, pose for a minute even, and we would try mm -hmm. to capture the gesture of the figure inside of a minute, and that really helped me speed up my drawing. Um, of course, you can't just sit there and draw with precision with your wrist when you're working on an 18 by 24 sheet of paper. And you're trying to create a drawing in a minute, um, so that will definitely get you faster. Um, having having your okay. your subjects moving. <laughs> that's right. And speaking of a minute, that's about what I've got left. You've so got one minute. I'm just going to try to throw a little more fresh. Oh, I had a blowout. Uh oh. Some fresh marks over here. He's switching. He's grabbing all kinds of oh pencils my gosh. over there. It's, uh, I have a tendency to press down pretty hard anyway, so that doesn't that happens relatively. Don't often reveal which me. one of those black wing pencils is the best. Don't, oh, don't, I won't. don't I won't. reveal it. No, you, know, you have to come back. There, there's one that's clearly better than the rest. You know what? That, maybe, well, I'm going to do a, a review for that pencil on its own. But um, anyway, uh, let's see here. Uh, Vancouver English teacher says great teaching. And since she's a Vancouver English teacher, she probably knows great teaching. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Sorry for my grammar. Uh, let's see. Boston King says, does Steedler lead holder smear much? I think he's talking about the lead itself. I, I don't I don't think it's it's very it's not any different from any other lead. It just depends on the weight. So if you're using a oh 21 seconds. If you're using a 4B or 5B, it's gonna smear um, just as much as probably the pencil that Matt mentioned before, one of those ebony pencils or layout pencils. So uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, if it's, you're using a 2H, it's not going to smear at all. It's barely going to come. It's barely even going to come off of the graphite. Maggie Webster asked, "Will your high school students do the same activity?" Um, they do similar activities. We, when I, and I mean by, um, with regard to timed drawing, you know, they they just really hate that. Um, but I, like I'm, Matt mentioned before, I think it's important. We do selfies, actually. They're not that interested in boats, I believe. So we take a selfie in class, and then we see how far we can get into it in 20 minutes. I've got to stop here. Your time uh, my is, time is up. up. And then we try the same <laughs> selfie again, and we see how far we can get into it in 40 minutes. And sometimes we, as we increase the time, they're surprised at uh, how well their drawing develops. Okay, uh, we're going to do a couple more uh, questions oh. there. Uh, the drawing is complete. Uh, I think Ashley did a fantastic job. Um, I think the, the one thing that you want to, that, that I want to point out anyway, is how accurate the angle of the boat is um, to the reference that he was working from. Uh, the angle is just spot on. The proportions are spot on too. I really think that Ashley did a fantastic job and everybody in the chat box is agreeing with that. Um, just a couple more questions. We'll do it real quick. Allie says, as a beginner, does it matter what type of paper you use and all of the tools or just draw with the basics? I don't think it matters what kind of paper you use. Um, I, when I was a beginner, um, I guess the cost could be an issue. So early on, and I'm talking about as a trained artist in classes, we used cheaper paper early, like newsprint and sketch paper. Sketch paper is a little different than drawing paper. Sketch paper is a lighter weight, usually 50 or 60 pound. And, uh, but we were making, um, in these, in these beginning level classes, we were not working on projects. We were, we were working on a sheet of paper only one time and we would never touch it again. It was about getting through lots and lots of drawings. And that's actually how you, you get, you, you build up your speed is by taking it as far as you can in one, two, four hours, and then, and then, uh, and then moving on, getting a lot of drawings behind you for your, for experience. 
Art by Duck asks, how long has it taken you to achieve the level of shading that you have? I have such a lack of skill when it comes to shading. I practice every day. It's getting better, but I'm still not there yet. Um, I would say, and I, you know, this isn't for me. I heard this from uh, uh, an older artist, a landscape artist that I actually um, worked with and for when I was a college student. His answer when he was asked how long it takes to make a, a drawing, you know, he was 70 at the time. He would say it's taken me uh, 50 years and 45 minutes. And so, you know, every drawing is, is uh, a result of all that time that you're putting in. And you're putting in the time you say you practice every day and it's going to pay off. All right, Coloring with D says, I wish I had you too. When I was in high school, I probably would have continued drawing. I'll tell you, continue, uh, Coloring with D, uh, why aren't you drawing? That sh <laughs> It shouldn't be who you had as a teacher that would hinder you from drawing. I, I didn't have art in high school. I took theater arts uh, because the school I went to did not offer visual art as a ninth grader, and I just stuck with theater arts and went all the way through, did my own portfolio to get into design school. There shouldn't be an excuse for why you shouldn't be drawing if you love to draw and create art when, when you agree with that. Yeah, don't let somebody else hold you back. Um, I had a, a, different than Matt, I had a poor experience in high school art. I took one art class and it was a disaster. The classroom management was horrible. There was erasers and crayons flying through the air and I never took another art class in high school. I just kept drawing and drawn with my friends and uh, we didn't have YouTube back then. So we probably learned a little bit slower and, uh, and then I had to wait until I got to college for some, some real serious art training too. All right, well, I think we're gonna go ahead and switch back over here. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, everybody, thanks for sticking around for, I guess the last hour, if you did. Um, just a reminder, we're gonna be continuing on over at thevirtualinstructor.com. We're starting a brand new live lesson series. I'm gonna be creating a realistic drawing, a realistic portrait drawing of one of my daughters. We're gonna be working with the grid technique. I'm gonna be working on hot press watercolor paper for this, and it should be a lot of fun. It's gonna be a very detail-oriented uh, process, of course. We're probably gonna go for at least seven to 10 lessons during that se series. Um, but I wanna thank uh, Ashley again for coming out tonight. And of course, he's gonna be a part of this all. So uh, it should be exciting moving forward. We're gonna be here again next uh, Wednesday at, at 6.30. Ashley, how was the experience for you? Oh, it was great. My, hand, my hands are filthy, so I know I did something. <laughs> Look at the palm of the hand. <laughs> Look at that graphite shine. Now, hold the palm of your hand up there. This is a great example of if you don't have enough tooth on your paper, how that's gonna accentuate the shine. It's on the other hand, there, there you go. go. Look at how there shiny that is. There's oh, no yeah. tooth on the palm of his hand and look how shiny that is. Now, of course, <laughs> one way that you can alleviate that is by putting down a uh, paper towel or a piece of paper underneath the palm of your hand if you don't want that smearing to happen there. So with that, everybody, I'm gonna go ahead and sign out. Remember, check out the link below. Um, if you wanna check out the pins we talked about earlier, free course videos and eBooks link below in our membership program as well. Um, thanks again for joining us. And uh, with that, we're gonna go ahead and sign out for this evening. Good night, everybody. Thanks guys.